Good day students, welcome to mathgodserve.com where we don't just solve, we teach. In this clip we're going to be going over problem 6 to 10 of the Geometry Common Core Regents exam for June 2016. Alright, let's take a look at uh, question number 6. It reads, a company is creating an object from a wooden cube with an edge length of 8.5 centimeters, a right circular cone with a diameter of 8 centimeters and an altitude of 8 centimeters will be cut out of the cube. Which expression represents the volume of the remaining wood? Okay, so I have a picture of three uh, shapes here to give you an idea of what's going on. So what we have is we have a wooden cube uh, right here. So this is a cube, side length 8.5 for all, all sides because we know all sides are congruent. And then we're going to take a right circular cone of diameter of 8 centimeters and altitude of 8 centimeters. So entire diameter here is going to be 8 centimeters and the, the um, altitude is going to be um, 8 centimeters also. So what's going to happen is that from this cube this cone will be taken out of this cube. So you end up with a cube that has a hollow center okay so we have this big big space uh, there in the cube you have some depth there I'm trying to show you how it looks um, so the question is what is the volume of this resulting um, wood with the conical depression in its center all right so in this problem we are going to let our formulas guide us okay so let's go ahead and go over the um, formula for the volume of the three of the two shapes we have here. Um, so for a cube, let's say so volume of cube is basically the side length raised to the third power. Alright, so from that we're going to be subtracting the volume of a cone. Which is uh, one third pi r square h. Okay, one third of the area of the base pi r square times the height h. Okay, and uh, if we subtract these two then we will be able to get the uh, volume of this resulting um, solid right here. Okay, so for this uh, uh, cube that we have the side length s is equal to 8.5 and uh, for the cone we just need to know what the radius is and the um, the altitude. Okay, so um, this is s is equal to side length is 8.5 and here the radius what is the radius we're told that the diameter is 8 centimeters so you have to be careful remember that uh, the radius is the diameter divided by 2 alright so what we're going to do is we're going to take the diameter which is 8 um, <coughs> 8 centimeters we're going to divide that by 2 and we have 4 centimeters for the radius and we're told that the altitude, which is also the height, is 8 centimeters. Alright, so volume of the cube is going to be, we we'll just substitute 8.5 into s to the third, so we have 8.5 raised to the third power. Okay, and then the volume of the cone, of this particular cone, is going to be 1 third pi times the radius, which is 4. Ti, um, pi r square, pi radius square times the altitude which is 8 or the height. Okay, so volume of remaining wood is simply going to be the difference. Okay, so it's going to be 8.5 raised to the third power. This is the volume of the cube minus the volume of the cone that was cut out of it, one third pi times 4 square times 8. Okay, and if you look at your options, the correct answer should be option number four. All right, let's take a look at question seven. It says two triangles must be congruent if... So before we start, let's take a look at the um, conditions for congruency for triangles. Okay, so um, congruency postulate and theorems are... Uh, we have SSS, all three sides are congruent. We have S, A, S, two sides and an included angle are congruent. Now there's a special case of S, A, S because in this problem we're looking at right triangles. Special case of S, A, S is H, L, the hypotenuse leg theorem. 
Okay, this is also SAS because the two triangles must be right triangles so that um, the two right angles they have, that 90 degree angle, they will congruent so that counts as the A. The hypotenuse counts as one S, the L counts as the other S. So HL and SAS are basically the same thing, okay? And we also have ASA and AAS. So it says two triangles must be congruent if, so to help us um, have a visual as to what's going on, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to sketch two right triangles, okay? All right, so since we have two right triangles, what can we conclude? Well, we can automatically conclude that we have A. Okay, two, these two angles are 90 degrees, so we have A. All right, now um, let's see. Condition number one, an acute angle in each triangle is congruent. So if this angle is congruent to that angle for condition number one, we have A and A, so is AA sufficient to prove that two triangles are congruent? Do you see AA on this list? The answer is no, so this does not work. All right, now let's move on to the next one. We have the lengths of the hypotenuse are equal. So we have H, okay, or let's just call it S. If you want to use the HL idea, you can call it H. If you want to use SAS, we can call it S, okay? So this side is congruent to that side. That's S. So what we have here is SA or H, if you want to use this notation. Is SA sufficient to conclude that two triangles are congruent? The answer is no. Option two does not work. All right, let's move on to question number, uh, option number three, sorry. The corresponding legs are congruent. The corresponding legs are congruent. So we know uh, a right triangle has two legs. Okay. So we this leg this leg right here corresponds to this leg. We're talking about the vertical leg. So vertical legs. This leg is congruent to that leg. That counts as S. Okay. And then this horizontal leg right here uh, corresponds to this horizontal leg right here so that they will congruent as S. Ladies and gentlemen, for option three, we have S A S. Is this a congruency um, postulated theorem? Yes, it is right here. Bam. So um, option three is correct. Your answer is option three. That is how you can prove that two right triangles must be congruent. All right, let's take a look at question eight. It says, which Sequence of transformations will map triangle ABC to triangle A prime, B prime, C prime. Okay, so one tip you want to keep in mind um, to really facilitate our solving of this problem is that uh, it has to do with dilations and rotations. Now, anytime you see the word dilation, think about your eyes. You know how it dilates um, in different light conditions. So anytime you see the word dilation, Think about a change in size. Okay, so if you have an object and an image of different sizes, some kind of dilation must have happened. So if you take a look at this scenario, are they the same size? You can clearly see that the image A prime B prime C prime is bigger, so dilation is involved here. Now rotation changes the tilt or the steepness of the size of the object. Okay, so if you look at one segment and the other looks to be of a different slope, then a rotation must have taken place. Okay, um, just keep that in mind. Now, um, reflections also change the tilt or slope of um, of an object, but in this particular case, we're going to pay close attention to which combination has um, a tilt alteration and a size alteration. Okay, now let's take a look at. Um, the options. Which of them has the keyword dilation? Okay, which of them was involves dilation? Option one does not have dilation. You scrap that one. Option two does not. You drop that. So it's, it's either option three or four. So um, which of these uh, transformations, translation or rotation, is going to change the tilt. You notice that, look at AB, the slope is one, you rise one and you 
you rise one and run one, two, three, four, and then look at um, a b here. I mean, yeah, a prime b prime here. The slope is entirely different. It has been tilted in another um, for to get a different um, slant. Okay, so what causes that tilt to happen? A translation or a rotation? The answer is clearly a rotation because um, to get this to happen, it was rotated um, counterclockwise and then dilated or dilated and then rotated counterclockwise. So this is a rotation and the change in the size, basically getting it bigger like that, getting it bigger is the, um, the dilation process. Okay. So the correct answer is clearly option number four because translation does not alter the tilt of the lines that formulate our triangle here. All right, let's take a look at question nine. It says in parallelogram ABCD, the diagonals AC and BD intersect at E. Which statement does not prove parallelogram ABCD is a rhombus? Okay, so let's go ahead and sketch a rhombus. Okay, so there goes my rhombus. You can think about a rhombus as a squished square, okay? Every square is a rhombus, but not every uh, rhombus is a square, okay? Um, if you have a rhombus that's equilateral and equiangular, all the angles are congruent, then you have a square case, all right? I don't want to draw that because that's not, um, that's a special case. I just want to draw a general case of a rhombus. So let's draw our diagonals. <coughs> right here. So what do we have? We have A, B, C, D. Okay. And the, the diagonals intersect at point E right here in the center. Now let's go through these um, statements right here to see which one does not apply to this uh, rhombus. Option one, AC is congruent to DB. Take a look at that for a second. Does that look accurate? We can clearly see that AC in this case, segment AC is um, less than segment AC or let's write it um, using a, a measurement notation. So the length of segment AC, which is AC is less than BD. Okay, so that clearly shows that segment AC is not congruent to DB. So you cannot use this to prove that um, that this parallelogram is a rhombus. All right, let's take a look at question number 10. It says in the diagram below uh, of circle O, OB and OC are the radii. Okay, and chords A, B, B, C, and A, C are drawn. Which statement must always be true? Now, if you take a look at this setup right here, um, a theorem should come to mind. And that theorem is known as the inscribed angles theorem. Okay, so what does that, what does the theorem tell us? This is what I want you to recall. The It's called the inscribed angle theorem. Okay, if you have a a central angle that extends the same arc as an inscribed angle, we can write two equations. Okay, so let's say we have something like this. So what I want you to recall is what the um, inscribed angle theorem tells us. Okay, so if the inscribed angle is x and the central angle is y, guess what? Um, X is basically one half of Y or Y is double X. Okay. So these are the, this is the, these are the two equations that should come up in your mind when you see a setup of this nature. Okay. This is the inscribed, um, angles, angle theorem. Okay. So. Can you see the inscribed and central angle in this setup? So this is the inscribed angle and this is the central angle. Okay, so what equations can we say? Uh, can we write using this um, setup we have here? 
we can easily uh, conclude that the measure of um, angle BOC, the central angle, is uh, double the measure of the inscribed angle BAC. We could say that, or we could say that the measure of the inscribed angle uh, BAC is one half of the measure of the central angle BOC. Okay, same thing. What you're doing here is just dividing both sides by two to get this equation. Okay, so let's look at the options. Do we have anything that's consistent with any of these two equations? Option number two, there goes your final answer. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. Uh, we appreciate it. If you found the contents of this tutorial beneficial to you, do give us a thumbs up. Your positive feedback is very important to us. Don't forget to subscribe um, for updates to the remainder of this review series. Any questions, clarifications, comments that you have, just include it in the comment section below and we'll be glad to correspond. More clips can be found on mattgoodserve.com. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.